So welcome to the last session of the day, uh, who will be given by Serene Yumak. Uh, she is an assistant professor of computer science at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She has 15 years of experience in the area of believable, believable virtual humans and social robots. And she works on computational models of social and emotional behaviors and evaluation of them. In particular, nonverbal behaviors, synthesis, uh, multi-party interaction, and emotion and memory modeling. Uh, her work, her talk, uh, is entitled Artificial Intelligence Driven Virtual Humans with Nonverbal Communication Skills. So, Serene, when you want, thank you. You have the word. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, it's a little bit difficult, of course, to, to sit in front of the screen because I don't see any of you, <laughs> uh, but uh, I will do my, my best. Feel free to, to interrupt and uh, ask questions. Uh, in, and it, it can be a little bit more interactive. Um, okay, so um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure um, to uh, give this uh, talk. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the human-centered computing group at Utrecht University um, in the interaction uh, division here. And um, um, as a little bit introduced, I'm working on the area of social robots and um, digital 3D digital humans. Uh, for the last uh, 15 years. And uh, the, the first uh, part of my career was more focused on human-robot interaction. And the last seven years, I'm uh, more um, uh, interested in 3D virtual human motion synthesis. So I will um, cover um, different topics uh, in, in this talk, uh, including the work I have been doing earlier, uh, as well as the ones that uh, I have been doing uh, more recently. So uh, I will be first talking about uh, animation, so from a more 3D graphics uh, computer animation perspective. Uh, I will tell about how to model the characters and make them move. So the animation basics, how to do body and facial animation. And then I will specifically focus on nonverbal behavior synthesis, uh, such as facial ex expressions, gestures, and, and gaze behavior, as I'm mainly work uh, working on the area of uh, social and uh, emotional interaction. And the second part of the talk uh, will also touch uh, the, the area of uh, conversational characters and intelligent uh, interactive virtual agents, uh, also social robots. So how we can create these conversational characters, how can we model social and emotional interaction? I will in particular mention the topics of uh, modeling emotions and mem memory and multi-party uh, interaction. So um, if you look at the state of the art of virtual characters, we have reached to a state where uh, the virtual characters are very, very realistic at the moment. I'm not sure if you are familiar with uh, MetaHumans, um, Unreal Engine MetaHumans, and probably you are also playing a lot of games. You should be familiar with uh, very realistic uh, characters. Um, so um, this is a pretty remarkable um, um, time. Uh, for creating 3D uh, digital humans as their appearance is, is very impressive. But we would like to still look into how are their behavior, their animations, how interactive uh, they are. Uh, if you look at the games, um, there are um, very realistic characters such as um, um, the game from uh, Detroit, uh, Becoming Human, Uncharted, Hellblade, also the Dutch uh, game company Guerrilla Games, it, they produce uh, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. So this kind of games, which has a, a storyline, concrete storyline and emotional and effective cues, they have very realistic digital uh, uh, characters. On the other hand of the spectrum, we have also uh, interactive virtual characters for specific VR or XR applications. Uh, for example, for training nonverbal communication skills, um, such as the tailspin or simulation uh, crew. Um, and also we see these characters in social uh, XR, social VR and AR, such as Microsoft Teams and Mesh and Facebook Horizon Workrooms or Meta. What is important to pay attention here is the uh, range of uh, believability of these characters and their ca capabilities. So on one end, uh, end of the spectrum, you can see very re realistic characters. Um, with convincing uh, facial animations and body uh, animations, but on the other end of the spe spectrum, for example, the characters from Meta, they don't—they still look very, very cartoony. 
So the, for example, Microsoft Teams Mesh one is some something in between all these closed uh, VR applications. Uh, they also have mid-range uh, uh, characters. Uh, so the choice of these characters, how they are appearing, and, and the fidelity of their animations is something to be decided uh, based on the uh, application and uh, what kind of technological limitations you have. So if you have um, a, a multiplayer online game with millions of people connecting, maybe you cannot have very, very realistic digital uh, characters. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a, a game that is uh, specifically designed for a particular domain, then you can push the, the limits. Uh, what is important here is that you have a matching um, appearance and animation. So it doesn't really make sense to push the boundaries of realism if your animations are not really supporting the quality. Uh, but on the other hand, the application uh, itself is also important. Like, for example, if you are using digital humans reporting from a very serious, um, uh, um, let's say, war zone, something like that, you cannot use really very uh, uh, cartoony uh, characters, which will not be very, very convincing. So I want to start a little bit from the basics because this is about motion and animation. So what is the, the word animation uh, about? So animate means give life to, according to, to Merriam-Webster dictionary. And the word comes from the Latin word anima, meaning breath or spirit, like the, the word animal. And as you all know uh, from our childhood, we are very, very much uh, used to watching cartoons. It starts with uh, Walt Disney's um, animation principles and also uh, like Pixar, for example, um, Disney um, um, and all these big, big companies, they uh, spent a lot of time to uh, make cartoons over the, the past couple of uh, uh, years. Uh, computer animation, on the other hand, is about algorithms and techniques that process 3D graphical data. It can be object position and orientation, but it can also be the shape, shading parameters, texture coordinates, light source parameters, camera parameters, etc. So if you are very new to the world of computer animation, I strongly recommend this book from Rick Parent. This is there are a lot of books uh, more from an artistic point of view for computer an animation, but there's not many books on uh, research oriented and algorithmic and techniques. Uh, and uh, th this book is a very good starting point uh, from a 3D graphics animation uh, perspective. Um, if you look at animation from a very broad perspective, you can have a very low level and very high level animation. So le low level animation techniques are things like shape and interpolation. And that uh, basically means um, an animator fill in the details of the motion given some information and target, target motions, like keyframing. Um, this is what artists do. But as computer scientists, we focus on high-level techniques. So we want to generate a motion given a set of rules or constraints. So it can be kinematics, inverse kinematics, or procedural physics-based um, uh, motion. And usually, uh, physics, physically based motion requires fairly sophisticated um, uh, computational algorithms. Um, I'm not sure how far you're familiar with animation tools, but I just wanted to show a quick slide on that, that there are different types of animation tools that you can generate content, such as Maya 3DS, 3D Studio Max, Motion Builder, etc. Uh, and on the other hand, you can also have a 3D graphics programming environments where you can program things from, from uh, scratch. Uh, and from there, you can also go to more high level game graphics engines or uh, um, libraries uh, that are specifically designed for skeletal animation, uh, such as uh, Cal 3D and SmartBody. Um, there are three general approaches to computer animation in general. The first one is artistic animation, where the artist is crafting the motion. It's based on purely keyframing and interpolation, and it's a very um, uh, time-consuming uh, approach, but most of the content is, is generated like that. On the other hand, now we have a lot of data and motion capture devices, and uh, thanks to the AI algorithms, of course, we are able to generate these algorithms, uh, these animations in a data-driven manner. Um, using audio and text as input. And in the second part of the, the talk, I will show uh, some of the examples of this that uh, are, we are doing in, in my group. Um, and finally, we have procedural animation, which are computational models of uh, motion. So there is no data involved in it. So you just uh, have to come up with mathematical formulas and physics-based simulations 
or behavioral simulation to simulate um, the, the, the motion. And depending on the application, an animation can be very, uh, very low level in, in detail, or it can be very uh, high level in detail, where you have to, for example, simulate the, the muscle, tendons, skeleton, um, for example, in, in medical applications. Um, so I would like to suggest this, uh, this, this paper as a, as a start to understand the problem of trade-off between naturalness and control in real-time animation of virtual humans. Uh, this is a major problem in, in the research field. Like we, if, you want, if you want to generate uh, characters with uh, interactive and real-time animations, on the one hand, we, want, we would like to push the boundaries of believability and naturalness. Uh, and for example, data-driven algorithms work very well for that. But um, when you do that, you also start to lose from uh, control, while the procedural algorithms might work better uh, in terms of uh, control. So there's always this trade-off between naturalness and, and uh, how, what are the control parameters um, that can generate this, this animation. Um, and that often also leads to um, specific um, um, control mechanisms for data-driven um, uh, algorithms, like, for example, style-based animation, animation control or emotion uh, control. Um, and uh, there's always is this, this tension uh, in the research area, uh, and all the, the, the research efforts are really focusing on this major problem of naturalness and, and control. Uh, I have mentioned about motion capture and data-driven uh, approach. So um, there are different type of motion capture technology. This is a, um, a screenshot from our motion capture and VR lab at Utrecht University. These are two, our, two of my master uh, students. Um, so uh, there are two types of motion capture systems, optical motion capture system, like you see in the, in the image here. Um, you um, uh, capture the movement uh, of the, the actors or actresses with multiple uh, cameras, for example, infrared cameras. The cameras can be uh, passive or, 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 or active. Uh, passive markers are, um, as you see in the image, retro reflective uh, markers, or you can also have like uh, light emitting active markers, or you can also go completely for markerless motion capture because with, with uh, video-based um, capturing uh, systems, it's nowadays possible even with your phone to capture people, of course, the quality uh, is, is still uh, debatable, and if uh, the, the animation community uh, for professional games and uh, films, it's uh, it's still going uh, uh, for the direction of uh, heavy motion capture setups. Uh, but of course, in the future, there's a potential for for completely going for markerless. And in addition to that, you can also use inertial um, uh, motion capture systems. Um, where you, for example, use an um, accelerometer or gyrometer to capture people um, outside. So you are not bound to a physical space. Maybe you want to capture people while they are doing uh, a sports, uh, like the, the, the solutions from Xsense. In that case, you can use some uh, inertial uh, markers. Um, so how can we represent virtual humans? Um, a virtual human is represented with a skeletal model, with, which is an underlying skeleton hierarchy, which is represented uh, uh, as, a, as a tree structure starting from the root node uh, on the hip. And surrounding this uh, skeletal structure, there is a polygonal mesh. And as you move the jo joints or the bones of, of this character, the vertices around this, um, these bones are also uh, moved. So skeletal representation is kind of a low uh, level of uh, low level of uh, representation um, to move the whole uh, uh, polygonal uh, mesh and the vertices of this 3D uh, object. Uh, and when we talk about animation, of course, we are talking about rotations and then joints. Um, for example, in this character, it's a typical um, uh, ragdoll character. You have three translational degrees of freedom and 48 rotational degrees of freedom. And depending on the joints, you can have up to three degrees of uh, freedom, such as knee, wrist, and arm. Uh, it's also good to know a little bit about the representations of uh, orientation. For example, Euler angles are um, uh, very good as a representation for animation input and setting joint limits, and it's very intuitive to understand. 
and it's, it's widely used, used in, in all these animation packages, but it comes with the problem of a gimbal, like where you lose one degree of freedom um, um, when you have uh, two joints um, overlapping uh, each other. Uh, another representation of orientations is uh, quaternions. Um, the advantage of quaternions is it's very good for uh, interpolation. You uh, apply specific quaternion mat, and this is what is used for uh, animation um, uh, widely. And at the end, of course, you need an orientation matrix because you have to render everything on the, on the computer. Uh, you have to do the 3D, uh, 2D projection, and that's very good uh, for computational efficiency, but it might not be good for storage and uh, interpolation. So these representations are used um, in for uh, specific purposes and might have advantages and disadvantages. How does the overall skeleton pausing process work? So at the very high level, we have an animation system um, that can be something like Unity or Unreal Engine where you define um, game states and these game states can activate, for example, the character is going to walk uh, to that object, things like that. Um, and this high level animation system sends these uh, set of poles um, and degrees of freedoms to the rigging system. And in the rigging system, um, there is a recursive traversal of this hierarchical uh, tree of, of joints using forward kinematics uh, to compute the world matri matrices. Uh, and on top of that, there's a skinning uh, system uh, which uses these world matrices to deform the skin uh, and to, to render it finally. So this is the skinning process, basically. As I mentioned before, there is a skeleton um, in, the, in the polygonal mesh. And as you move one of the joints, for example, on the arm or the fingers, um, the, the vertices that are closest to this um, um, joint uh, moves along uh, with this uh, uh, joint. Um, and usually uh, one vertice uh, can be affected by multiple joints, two or three joints. And um, uh, the, uh, the, the basic way to do skinning is linear blend skinning by uh, simply taking a linear uh, sum of these uh, effects uh, to produce the skinning uh, effect. Uh, so the overall skinning algorithm works with fitting the skeleton into the mesh and finding the matrix that defines where the joint was when the uh, mesh was attached. So this is called the binding matrix. And then we convert the position of the vertices to the local coordinates of each one uh, by inverting the binding matrix. Then we move the joints to the new, new pose. Uh, we calculate the global position of the vertices and we make this local to global matrix uh, conversion because we want to uh, compute everything in the global uh, world and uh, in, in, in 3D graphics, because we want to render things at the end. And finally, we blend the results. This is what I told, like linear blending of the effect of each, each mon. But there are some problems with this uh, linear um, uh, blending uh, smooth skin uh, algorithm. Um, this is called the skin collapse bending and candy wrapper uh, effect. Because it's a linear blending uh, situation, you lose some of the, 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 the mesh, the, the points. Uh, in order to um, get over this, this problem, um, another method was produced, uh, which was called um, dual quaternion uh, blending. So it actually represents both translations and rotations in, in the dual quaternion format. As I mentioned earlier, quaternions are very good for uh, interpolation, so they can uh, handle these problems in linear interpolation and it overcomes this bending and candy wrapper effect. And this method uh, nowadays is part of um, uh, most 3D modeling uh, tools such as Maya and Blender. I will not go very much into the details of skinning, so it's a topic by itself, but if you have further interest in this topic, I would like to refer you to, uh, to this uh, excellent uh, uh, course um, that covers both the direct methods for such as linear blend skinning, but also like more automatic and data-driven methods um, uh, for, for skinning. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about the facial animation. So different from body an uh, animation, facial animation is a very difficult task. That's because it's largely do done by artists, because faces are too familiar to us, they are unique, and they have a complex structure. So if we really uh, want to simulate the, the human head, um, it, it's pretty complex. There are a lot of muscles, um, there are, there are um, uh, tensions and relaxations of the facial skin and the jaw. It's a complex structure. It has bones, 
but as well as muscles. So all these things have to be uh, stimulated. But then you might ask the question to what extent I will, I will do that. Uh, it depends on the application. Most of the games nowadays are based on um, shape interpolation technique. I will tell a little bit more about that. It's also called blend shape uh, animation. But if you are also dealing with medical simulations, uh, you can um, um, uh, model all the underlying structure uh, using, for example, physics-based uh, approach. Um, so majority of facial animation nowadays in, 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 in games or in uh, cartoons, like Frozen, for example, uh, they are done uh, by artists, but it's also possible to capture the facial animation uh, using 4D scanners. And if you look at the state of facial animation nowadays, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's re uh, reached to a very, very convincing uh, stage. So there's a concept called uncanny valet. Probably you know it as well because it's a, it's a, it's a known concept in the human-robot interaction area as well. Uh, basically, it says uh, as the, the, the realism of the uh, characters or robots increases, um, the uh, yeah, affinity towards them increases to a certain point and there's a sudden drop, which is called the uncanny uh, valet. And recent research uh, on, on 3D digital humans uh, shows that we are able to ascend this uh, valet. Uh, with the, the state-of-the-art photorealism that's coming from, for example, for um, yeah, Unreal Engine MetaHumans or many other, many other uh, examples. And there are two levels of facial animation. Um, one is to consider uh, the temporal domain, so dynamics of the motion, how the feature points or muscle contractions are uh, happening. And uh, the techniques are like blending, morphing and lin linear interpolation. Um, and uh, the other dimension, the other level, is the spatial domain. So how all the vertices uh, on the face will um, will will deform uh, the, the the surface of the face, and this is the displacement of vertices uh, for a high resolution mesh. And you can also think of wrinkles and things like that. And here you can apply shape interpolation, or, um, some parametric models, or physics-based uh, uh, animation. Um, the Current technique uh, widely used in industry, also in, in research world, is blend shape uh, based facial animation. It's simply a shape interpolation uh, technique. Uh, from a matte point of view, you can see it as, a, as weights and basis vectors, which are the blend shapes coming together with, with, with these blend, uh, blend weights. And blend shapes are basically a one uh, configuration. Uh, of the of a facial expression, it can be neutral, it can be happy, or it can be the the, the movement of the corner of the, the mouth, things like that. And when you combine all these different uh, facial expressions together, you can uh, recreate new uh, facial expressions. Um, uh, an industry term for this is uh, it's called slider values or blend shape or morph uh, targets because the the animators are are manipulating or changing these these uh, sliders. And uh, you can have um, hundreds or thousands of uh, blend shapes, depending on the complexity of the, um, uh, the, the, the animation or the game or the, or the movie that uh, you are developing. So how can you construct a blend shape? So as I said, a blend shape is one, one configuration of the fa face. Um, you can uh, capture it from, from uh, um, uh, for example, video uh, images. You can uh, uh, do, do 3D construction, or you can scan a real actor. Uh, you can get a point cloud and then uh, uh, register it uh, to a, a mesh-based um, um, uh, target head. Um, and if you look, for example, um, in the Lord of the Rings, it has like um, 675 targets, and it has been many years already, already back. And you can find really like a very complex um, uh, facial animation models. Um, in addition to shape and inter interpolation, you can also talk about uh, parameterization of the face. So um, over the years, there has there have been a different type of parameterizations. I give one example here, which is a MPEG-4 facial animation uh, parameters standards. Um, so there are facial definition parameters, uh, it's called the FAP parameters, 84 of them defined, which defines the 3D face geometry. So it's not about the animation yet, but just how the face is, is um, geometrically defined. 
um, and these parameters distinguishes one face from the other. Uh, the other set of parameters are uh, facial animation parameters. There are 68 uh, of them in the image. You see the fixed points uh, on the character, but there are also uh, the ones with arrows. So this, the, the ones with the arrows are the facial animation parameters. Uh, you can also define facial animation parameter unit, units, which are the distances between key facial features on a specific uh, face, so that you can scale these uh, uh, facial animation uh, parameters and apply it to any, any kind of uh, face. Uh, traditionally, facial animation is done procedurally. So uh, let's say if you have a text or audio, you analyze the phonemes. Phonemes are the building blocks uh, of, uh, of uh, audio or text. And for each phoneme, there's a corresponding rhythm, which is uh, the visual counterpart of a phoneme. Um, and these uh, high-level rhythm definitions are converted into animation parameters. For example, it can be the MPEG-4 animation parameters or facial action coding units or blend shapes, etc. So you can, for example, analyze the text uh, and uh, find the building blocks uh, using a text-to-speech system, and then you can convert it to phonemes. Um, there exists a reason for each phoneme or a set of phonemes. Um, um, but the thing is, in speech production, boundaries between these discrete units, phonemes, are not very uh, concrete. So they're overlapping each other, which is called the phone uh, phenomenon of co-articulation. And the speech animation community is actually uh, focusing on solving this uh, co-articulation problem. The more realistic the co-articulation, the more realistic your um, animation. And it's not a very easy problem. You need to analyze, uh, maybe empirically look into your, your data and to, to drive some rules uh, to generate a procedural uh, speech animation. Or the other way is you can learn it from um, data. In the early days, people were mostly focusing on procedural animations or rule-based animations, and that didn't really result into very good uh, animations in the, in the early days. That's because people switched to data-driven animation. But in the last couple of years, uh, there, there was, uh, uh, again, a kind of a turn back to procedural facial animation. Uh, in 2016, there was a paper, Jolly, uh, which is about uh, animating jaw and lip movements specifically. Uh, on a two-dimensional axis. It was a completely rule-based approach, but it uh, uh, produces uh, um, very good results in comparison to pre previous approach, so which um, kind of uh, uh, brought back the, the procedural animation idea in the facial animation uh, community. They even uh, set up a company uh, with, this, uh, with this work. Um, the other direction is learning co-articulation from data. Um, this is one of the early works uh, on, on learning co-articulation from data to, by analyzing the audio. And it was a technique based on uh, motion graphs. Uh, it, it was called anim graph in that case, but motion graphs are in general an animation technique that can be also used for body animation. In that case, uh, they were using it for, for facial animation. Um, by constructing an animation graph and analyzing an, the emotional uh, signal in the audio, um, the, the authors were able to create expressive lip, lip sync uh, uh, motion. If you look at a little bit uh, more in detail uh, to that, so the an animation graph uh, is composed of different um, um, uh, items, uh, such as the phoneme label, trajectories of the prosthetic features, uh, compressed the motion, the motion, actual motion itself, and the emotion label. So based on these uh, four uh, different items, an animation graph was um, uh, created. And then the, the, there is a constraint graph search algorithm to find the best path uh, by, by minimizing certain uh, conditions, for example, smoothness of the, of the curves. Um, they were also analyzing the uh, emotional, um, uh, um, yeah, the emotional annotation from this uh, input audio, just like an emotion classifier, and feeding this also into the to the um, constraint graph search uh, algorithm to pick the best sequence of animations um, uh, using a uh, motion capture uh, data data set. Uh, so it was done this way in the early days, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, even more. Video-based facial animation started to be, become uh, very um, uh, widely used, especially in the era where we had um, Kinect uh, depth cameras. Um, it started with um, um, 
uh, SIGGRAPH paper in 2013, online modeling for real-time uh, facial animation. Um, and uh, there has been a lot of different iterations of this, uh, for example, using a depth camera, but then using a single video camera, using a mobile phone, phone camera. Uh, and you, you uh, at the end, started to have uh, facial animation captured on your mobile phone. So actually, this, this last uh, work, uh, Face Shift, Marculous Motion Capture, it became part of uh, your iPhone iPhone purchased this company and it started to be everywhere um, uh, since since then. Um, and if we really look at um, even more like last five years, five, seven years, uh, we started to see a lot of data driven face and body animation uh, work. Uh, this is with the, the rise of uh, AI and deep learning algorithms um, like image generation or speech or text uh, generation. Um, deep learning algorithms and machine, advanced machine learning algorithms uh, uh, proved to be very uh, well working on uh, motion generation as well, um, including facial expressions, uh, anim facial animation generation, or uh, conversational gestures uh, generation, or for example, um, um, dyadic interactions, not only uh, an animating one, one character, like given audio or text, but how we can generate um, interactive animations, taking into account the, the other person or listening behavior. Um, and it was also, they started to focus also not only on, um, for example, blend shapes, but also uh, 3D scanned data, point cloud data, so different type of data uh, was also uh, experimented with. Um, and it's also possible, for example, to drive the gaze behavior of a character, the eyeballs movement uh, from the uh, motion capture uh, system. Um, so this field started to grow very fast in the last couple of years. Earlier, there were some um, there were some um, um, examples of data-driven uh, uh, nonverbal behavior generation, but that was not very uh, uh, very much proved yet. Uh, but in the last couple of years, uh, it's a very growing field. There are a lot of PhD students and um, master's students that are working in this area. Um, and as, as more um, uh, data and more research work is produced, now the question is how can we benchmark them and how can we compare them and find uh, uh, solid uh, uh, evaluation methods to compare these techniques uh, to each other, like it is happening in, in the computer vision community, for example. Okay, so um, I have a little bit given overview so far, and in the next couple of slides, I also want to show the work that we have been doing. But first, I want to start with introducing what are nonverbal behaviors. Um, I'm focusing in general the computer animation domain, so we can uh, animate um, people that are running or uh, dancing or yeah, any kind of motion that you can imagine. But um, I'm specifically interested in social signals uh, and nonverbal cues that are happening uh, during uh, communication. And this topic uh, is subject to uh, research in different communities. Uh, one is uh, the social signal processing uh, community and the other one is um, nonverbal communication in, in, in the virtual world. So there are uh, both the 3D graphics animation people and uh, social effective computing um, communities, they are interested in, this, uh, in these topics. Um, the first work that I want to, to mention from our group is uh, audio-driven emotional speech animation. I earlier mentioned the work of uh, Jolly, yeah, the procedural work. This is not a data-driven uh, animation, but a procedural animation uh, research. And it's a follow-up uh, of the, the, the Jolly uh, model. Uh, we would like, we wanted to develop um, uh, a speech-driven um, or audio-driven uh, speech and ellipsing animation method, taking into account the emotional uh, signal analysis in the audio. So our goal was uh, we want to create uh, um, natural characters, but we want to, to keep control as high uh, priority because uh, we want to use these characters in, in games. Um, and uh, in our method, we were taking into account an uh, audio file and we were parsing the audio file for the, for the phonemes. And we applied an expressive speech component and dynamic co-articulation um, uh, model that changed uh, depending on the emotional um, uh, signals, signal analysis, the intensity and pitch in, in the audio. 
Um, and we compared our methods. At th this was done in 2019 uh, with existing commercial applications at that time, such as FaceFX and Roco Digital. And, uh, and we also developed it as a Unity plugin. And we uh, indeed found that this addition of emotional speech analysis uh, proved itself to be a good contribution. So we, our methods were, were uh, 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 perceived be better in terms of believability in comparison to these two applications. Um, lately, um, in my group, we are also working on data-driven facial animation, for example, um, using motion capture uh, markers, uh, motion capture data, we are applying deep learning algorithms to apply dimensionality reduction, reduction and to control, uh, to find control uh, parameters, or um, mapping one facial animation from one character uh, to another character, or from motion capture data to any character. It can be a cartoon character, a realistic character, or a monster, something like that and how we can do this, this mapping in an automatic way using uh, um, uh, neural networks. Um, I want to show you a, a short clip uh, here. Uh, this is uh, one of the latest work we are, um, uh, um, so I, 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 I don't mention uh, it yet because we are in the process of publishing this uh, at this moment, but what you will, you will see here is uh, on the left, you see um, a neutral face, in the middle you will see an expressive character and in the last uh, one, you will see the heat map that shows the difference between the neutral and expressive uh, uh, faces. Uh, here we are using a, um, um, an advanced uh, deep learning algorithm, uh, Hubert and, and Transformers, uh, in order to automatically generate, given an audio, uh, the facial expression using um, scanned uh, data. So they are like masks uh, and uh, uh, point cloud data uh, converted into meshes. Uh, and we can apply any kind of uh, uh, audio to, to generate the motion. So I will play the clip now. Stuff. Oh. oh. Okay. This is Melly Street from uh, Devil Wears Prada. You go to your closet and you select so you are using that different type of blue inputs sweater, that we find instance, uh, because you're trying to tell the world actors and you actors are speaking. take yourself too seriously to care about what you put on your back but what you don't know is that that sweater is not just blue it's not turquoise it's not lapis it's actually cerulean do you think that your client one of the wealthiest, most powerful men in the world. They seek to be able to land. You can apply it to different kind of languages, different kind of characters. And your plan is just to black this person. Stop. Okay. Um, we were not only looking into um, generating motion, but uh, we are also interested in perception uh, of uh, animation. So, as I mentioned, the appearance of the characters improved a lot, um, but we would like to look into how the animations are, are, were also perceived. Um, so, we made a user study, we generated different kind of um, uh, appearance realism, low high fidelity, and also in, in different type of uh, animation realism. Um, and we lo looked into the match or mismatch between motion realism and appearance realism. And uh, we were looking on, into parameters such as uncanny valet, like uh, how um, believable these characters were perceived and what is the, the level of social presence, etc. And we found out that um, the, the mismatch of motion realism and appearance realism led to significantly higher uh, eeriness, meaning um, higher uncanny valet feeling. Um, and higher appearance uh, realism, as expected, led to significantly higher social presence. And for the full motion realism, higher appearance realism led to significantly higher social presence itself. So we, we, we run a lot of different uh, studies. I, I cannot really tell about all of them in, in, in one slide, uh, but I can share with you the details later. Uh, with the paper, state-of-the-art photorealistic appearance lends itself better to highly realistic animations than lower appearance realism. This is what we uh, come up with uh, at the end of this uh, uh, study. So uh, looking into only photorealistic appearance is not, um, is not enough. We have to always find the matching um, between how the animation uh, fits into the appearance uh, of the character. Uh, if you want to use in your application or in your game a very realistic character, you should also 
uh, effort to generate very realistic matching uh, animations. Uh, if you will not be able to do that, it's better to stick with lower level of uh, realism. So high level of realism is not always the best way uh, to, to go. Um, we have been also working on other types of animation, not only face, but uh, for example, gaze animation. And that was a collaboration with um, Guerrilla Games, um, the producer of Horizon Zero Dawn game uh, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Um, uh, here, our goal was to generate automatically the, the movement of the uh, character, like the upper body, the look at behavior or the gaze behavior, uh, we call it. Uh, so the movement of the, the, the head, the eyes, and the upper body uh, joints. And we did that in different conditions, like sitting, standing, and lay, laying down. So here you see the character is, is following the beer mug that's flying around. And we simulated this behavior uh, with data collection in the motion capture lab. Uh, my student, uh, uh, Alex, he, he is, uh, in the video, is collecting data. At the end of the stick, uh, there's, a, there's a marker, which is representing this target object. Um, and the actor is, is, is following this, this target object, like a gaze following behavior. And after the collecting this data, we run a, a sequential model, a, a, a gated recurrent unit on this. Uh, given the pose and the target uh, object uh, location uh, or position, uh, we train this um, um, uh, gated recurrent uh, unit to pr produce the, uh, the, the joints. There were like 21 uh, joints in the upper body um, to uh, simulate the, this behavior. So um, Guerrilla Games actually uh, asked us um, to uh, find an alternative to their in-house procedural gaze animation or look at animation uh, method. Um, so we made a comparison with their current procedural approach and our approach using uh, the recurrent neural networks. And indeed, uh, we have seen that a data-driven approach uh, proves to be a promising direction for that type of uh, work. And we, we got uh, um, pretty good results in internal comparisons uh, done by uh, Guerrilla Game uh, expert uh, animators. Um, so in addition to gaze and um, facial animations, uh, we have been also working on um, music-driven animation. Uh, so in particular, music-driven expressive gestures. These are the type of gestures that are happening when you are, for example, playing an instrument. So the goal was not to model specifically the finger movements while playing piano, um, but to capture the, the, the upper body movement, the gestures that's following the rhythm uh, of, the, uh, of the music. Um, and uh, we worked with a motion capture uh, data set of uh, pi piano playing. Um, and uh, there were different type of rhythm uh, variations in the, in the, um, in the data set. Um, and we applied a sequential model again, long short term term memory network. So this is from 2020. There were not, we, we didn't try the transformers or more advanced methods at that time. Uh, as an input, um, we were feeding in musical features and body position, and it was generating again the full upper, upper body position. And we looked into different type of metrics such as pitch, pitch and beat. Um, MFCCs, etc., and to, to, to compare all these uh, input features and to find out which features are, are uh, working better, uh, looking at metrics such as uh, average positional error, uh, acceleration, uh, and jerk, which is a uh, derivative of uh, acceleration that is an indication of how smooth is the, the animation. Um, that work was also kind of a collaboration with a, with a, with a foundation, with a company, and that was uh, uh, producing um, uh, companion characters for uh, children, disabled uh, children. Um, so it started in the context of uh, that project. So how, how can we uh, create virtual characters that can accompany um, yeah, children playing in an, in an orchestra? I will show you a short clip here as well. So here, the dark character I hope you can see it properly, is the one that is generated and the more pale one is the one that is the ground truth. Uh, one interesting thing, maybe observation that needs to be uh, considered here is in expressive behavior generation, different from other domains, we don't really need to follow exactly 
uh, the, the ground truth because gestures are uh, happening in a very, very random way. Like one text that is matching with a particular gesture uh, might not be the same in another context, depending on the person. So that, that's because um, um, objective metrics are not always the only criteria. Yeah, you also need to always look into subjective metrics. In animation research, you always have two categories of evaluation, objective and uh, subjective uh, metrics uh, users. Um, I have also looked into um, generating motion during group conversations. So let's say you have a, a, a group of characters um, in a game, uh, which are kind of at the background. They don't have to be very realistic but you want to simulate their behavior automatically. That was not a deep learning based approach, but it was um, taking into account uh, Bayesian uh, networks. So we were looking uh, into the data set, Carnegie Mellon panoptic data sets, which was captured with multiple um, depth cameras, Kinex in a dome kind of environment. Uh, we on annotated this data and extracted turn taking states and gaze directions, and also uh, um, uh, different type of gestures. And we uh, um, um, uh, calculated a prob probabilistic model to generate uh, the turn-taking effect. Uh, so here in the in the video, you see um, when, whenever there is a red um, uh, dot uh, on top of the head of the character, this is the character that has the floor, and how this um, the behavior of this character will be generated uh, using um, uh, using this automatic method was the, the main goal of this uh, this study. Um, so here you see a, a short video clip um, that is um, from a data collection session from our uh, mocap lab um, because the, now we are trying to push the boundaries of how can we generate multimodal and multi-party animation. So we started with a dyadic interaction uh, context where two people are interacting with each other in a casual way and we, we collected 10 hours of data um, including finger movements, facial expressions, and all the body by body movements, and also uh, other uh, um, modalities such as audio uh, and, and video data. And we would like to to now use this data to also further the, our uh, work on multimodal and multi-party um, uh, animation. Uh, so far, I talked about animation, um, animation synthesis or motion synthesis. But as I said at the beginning, I have been also working on interaction. Um, so interaction, intelligent virtual agents or yeah, social robots, uh, you can also have physical robots, um, is an area that attracted a lot of attention from um, commercial uh, companies as well. So the, for example, NVIDIA, uh, Violet, uh, Samsung, Sam, Samsung Neon, um, there are companies such as Soul Machines that develop uh, chatbots uh, with a face, with a very realistic application that is used in, in several applications from finance to marketing um, or uh, as, a, as a, you know, banking, mortgage advisor, things like that. So it's something similar to ch chat GPT or any kind of chat chatbot, uh, but with, with a face. Um, if you look at the overall steps in interaction with virtual humans, you know, on a very high level, we can talk about three uh, different blocks. So the first block is understanding the social and effective cues. In the middle, we have the decision making and the dialogue. And the last part is generating social and effective cues. So what I was talking about so far is, is only the last block. And there's a lot going on already in that area. Uh, but I have also uh, I have been also working on these first uh, two blocks, understanding social and effective cues and decision making. And I want to, to show some examples of this. Um, but before that, uh, for interactive virtual characters, there are a set of required capabilities. Um, these are, for example, expressing, perceiving emotions, communicating with high level dialogue, dialogue uh, using natural ways of communication, facial expressions, gestures, speech. Um, but also more high level properties such as establishing, maintaining social relationships, having a personality, learning, recognizing models of others and learning uh, more high level social uh, competencies. Uh, so and there is a lot of things, a lot of different type of components uh, when you want to, to develop interactive virtual humans. And I often joke about that you need a whole uh, computer science department or whole uh, whole faculty to really develop a full-fledged 
uh, interactive uh, character. So it's, it's a very, very broad uh, research uh, uh, field. Um, one area I was uh, specifically focusing on is modeling emotions and, and memory. Um, uh, that was developed for a, a, a robotic uh, tutor. We um, developed a virtual version of it, but also a robotic version of it. it this was a, a robot head uh, from uh, Hanson Robotics. Um, and here you see the, the architecture of emotion and memory-based interaction. And we were um, detecting uh, the, the, the face um, uh, and uh, the speech uh, from, the, from the users. And we were automatically uh, uh, recognizing and remembering the names of the people and also the content of the, um, the, of the, of the interaction. Uh, specifically, we were focusing on episodic memory uh, and emotional uh, interaction. So it was a, a teaching scenario uh, and we wanted to develop this fully autonomous uh, system uh, where the, uh, the, the teacher robot is remembering past interactions with the student uh, to find out what happened and how, how their learning progress was and also the, um, the, uh, the episodes that were more emotionally uh, salient. Uh, we had a planner and uh, a reactive layer for the dialogue manager and uh, an episodic memory with long and short term episodic memory, which were, was working um, in a coordination with an emotion engine um, that was setting the personality, mood and uh, emotion uh, changes, dynamic emotion changes of the, of the virtual character. And based on these past interactions, it was um, um, coming up with an overall score of relationship. Uh, and at the end, it was producing uh, facial animation and text to, to, to speech. Uh, we run this um, a robot uh, in a long-term interaction experiment, not like months, but um, um, four uh, sessions uh, over uh, four weeks and uh, 20 minutes interaction per, uh, per session uh, in order to find out how the effect of emotion and memory um, uh, increases the, the uh, engagement uh, ex experience, the social presence and also task engagement. And we indeed found out that uh, the robot uh, with, with the condition of emotion and, um, and memory capacity uh, was perceived uh, better um, uh, by the users. Um, I also worked on multi-party situated interaction. Uh, that was not a robot, but you can also call it a robot. It's a virtual character that is situated in a, in a physical space. It was a virtual reception, receptionist at the entrance of our computer science um, building. And here our goal was to uh, develop an autonomous gaze animation uh, model uh, based on the attention that the users were paying um, to, to the character. So we were uh, calculating an uh, engagement uh, score uh, how far these, these users are in, um, engaged with the virtual character, because since it's a, a, a receptionist, there could be multiple people passing in front of the, the character. Some of them are just passing by, some of them are really staying and spending time to interact with the character. And before even starting the conversation, uh, the character has to find out uh, whether uh, this person is paying attention. And we were looking into different type of features coming from the uh, depth camera, uh, change of distance and orientation, um, closeness to the center of field, um, speaking, smiling for the different type of cues. And based on uh, the combination of these cues, uh, we calculated an engagement score, which was then uh, driving the behavior of the autonomous uh, agent. And finally, uh, I would like to mention we also worked on multi-party uh, dialogue uh, based on the social practices uh, theory. Uh, which is a theory that defines all our actions uh, in, in terms of uh, um, kind of action and reaction. Like, for example, if you uh, want to shake hands with someone, you uh, yeah, uh, reach out uh, to this person and you expect the person to uh, respond to you. So and this, this is basically how the theory is, is working. You have everything in, in a social context defined in terms of these practices, social practices. And based on this theory, we developed a multi-part dialogue uh, system. And this was a, a couples uh, therapy session where the, the user is a, uh, is a game, um, a, um, is, is a user of the, of the game. And then we had two, two characters um, where these characters were autonomously taking turns and um, um, managing a three-party uh, conversation.
Okay, I'm not sure how I'm doing with time. I'm, I guess, talking for almost an hour, but I'm wrapping up now. Um, so finally, I want to mention about the challenges in this area. So I talked a lot about data-driven approach and data collection. So data is, is really working very well at the moment, but different from um, 2D images or videos that you find on, on everywhere right now, uh, when you talk uh, about 3D um, the, uh, motion, uh, we don't have a lot of data. So the data is collected in motion capture labs uh, at the moment, or you can extract um, uh, 3D motion uh, from 2D videos, but these are not very good quality at the moment, and you don't really have controlled experiments. You don't know what type of motion, what type of emotional content they, they have. So um, in that sense, for 3D motion synthesis, data collection problem uh, still remains there but on top of that of course we also need sophisticated algorithms deep learning algorithms uh, works well but they are black box algorithms they are difficult to debug and they can be uh, computationally expensive um, the other challenge is the evaluation so there's a gap between subjective and objective metrics i a little bit briefly touched to this topic so sometimes in this kind of research objective metrics might show very good results but when you look at the subjective results it might not uh, um, directly match. So it's really important to, um, to do the, the subjective and objective evaluations in, in parallel and also defining meaningful evaluation uh, uh, metrics and also doing a lot of benchmarking because in computer vision, for example, there's a lot of opportunity to do benchmarking to other uh, methods. Um, in this uh, uh, field, it's still a developing area. So um, uh, de developing platforms to, to make co uh, comparisons between different type of uh, techniques is, is also interesting. For example, we were organizing this um, Genea workshop and Genea challenge uh, to make a comparison between um, um, different gesture generation methods. And finally, uh, social signal processing is studied well, relatively well in, in human agent interaction or robot interaction, but uh, in XR, VR and AR, it's, it's relatively uh, um, very new. So how can we interpret social and emotional states of users in, in VR and how can we generate automatic uh, responses? This is still an area that has to be uh, explored uh, uh, further. Um, in IEEE VR conference, we are also organizing a workshop in this area. It's um, actually very soon in, in March, 25th of March. So if you are um, in, in this conference, just keep that in mind that uh, there will be interesting discussions uh, about this topic. Um, so in conclusion, virtual humans reach to a state where they can be modeled very realistically, but uh, realism in movement and interaction is still missing. Uh, interactive applications, they require on the fly generation of animations and behavior, and we need to do perceptual studies to understand what works for which type of uh, application. So it's not about generating algorithms, but we have to critically analyze uh, what works uh, uh, in, in, in different uh, situations uh, through subjective analysis. Um, so all this work was, of course, not alone. I would like to thank all my students and then collaborators uh, over the years. Um, and uh, here there is a short clip, um, uh, well, maybe not so short, from our uh, motion capture and VR lab. Uh, maybe it runs in the background and then we can already start um, taking uh, questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sarin, for your nice presentation. And now uh, we will have some, have some time for questions. Anyone has a question? So first, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it has been super interesting. And I noticed that all the methods uh, you mentioned for using deep learning, mm -hmm. all of them are based on supervised deep learning, if mm -hmm. I understood correctly. So the, is there anything proposed using different approaches like semi-supervised or unsupervised? No, we, well, we didn't really look into that at the moment, um, but we, we, we would like to step into that. But the thing is actually, as I mentioned, there are, before coming to that, there are quite some uh, challenges <laughs> um, um, in terms of getting the, the right data and uh, post-processing the data. Uh, so 
in, in terms of the advancement of the methods, this is a little bit behind in, in comparison to computer vision. Uh, but yes, we would like to look into more, more, uh, more, uh, more, more advanced methods. Uh, we are currently looking into transformers and uh, um, uh, diffusion uh, mo models. Um, yeah, but they are still se sequential models. Um, but yeah, uh, there there is a lot to be done on the uh, unsupervised uh, direction as well. Okay, thank you. All questions. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And well, uh, I have a question that, uh, well, it's out of cu uh, curiosity, but mm -hmm. I think I understood that in the multi-party dialogue, mm -hmm. the, the, the agents, well, they autonomously uh, interchange or well yeah they they answer your your i don't know how to say uh, they are not questions but your dialogues uh, and they they respond to that uh, autonomously in which way um so um what we have generated is based on this social practices theory we created some social context so, so um, for example in terms of conjunctions or this disjunctions like how uh, what what kind of expectations can happen in in a certain context so based on these definitions it's a it's a bit more complex than one to one in interaction um for example if there is a certain situation a, a social expectation the characters might uh, initiate the dialogue or might wait for the other uh, character to to respond uh, instead so it's it's about managing the turn taking uh, in the in the multi party interaction Okay, so they can uh, talk uh, one agent with the other agent in the... Uh, I think they can, yes. It's a three-party conversation, so they can talk to each other, but they can also talk to, to the user. Okay, very interesting, thank you. Uh, hi, sir. Thank Hello. you for your presentation. Uh, when you talk about uh, motion generation or animation generation based on data-driven models, uh, you use motion capturing to capture motion information about the user and also speed features. But then when you generate the motion, uh, you ha uh, this motion has to be synchronized with the voice of the agent. Mm -hmm. How do you could you tell us how do you s make this synchronization? Because uh, when you train with the, da the data, the mm -hmm. speech has sa uh, some uh, features, mm -hmm. but then when you generate other speeds, can have di completely different speech features. How do yeah. you synchronize the motion with the speed generated? Yeah, yeah, very good question. So when we are um, collecting the data first, we have a synchronization of audio and uh, motion in the beginning. So uh, we are using basically a very traditional method, a, a clapper <laughs> in the in the room. Um, and uh, after we, we use this, we are also um, uh, using uh, an alignment uh, of the of the audio and uh, the, like the beginning and end of the, the audio and the, the motion. But on top of that, as you said, there are also uh, differences in terms of how the data is generated, the frame rate, etc. So for this, we are also uh, aligning the frame rate of the um, of the motion capture data together with the, the audio. We are also using, um, uh, for example, a window uh, approach. So uh, we are calculating the features over a, win a window of motion. And from the same window, we are ex extracting the, the, the features. And this is how it is fed into the, um, um, the, the deep learning algorithm. OK, thank you. Mm, I have uh, another one. Mm -hmm. You also talk about uh, emotions. Uh, uh, you know that agents can also generate motion based on, on that emotions. Mm -hmm. But 
when you record uh, someone showing any emotion, this emotion is recorded with some a level of emotion. Mm -hmm. But then when you want to generate one, this motion can be adapted or has to be the same or similar to the data. Uh, uh, you are talking about the emotion memory modeling work. Uh, no, no, I'm talking about, uh, uh, for, for instance, an, uh, an agent uh, mm -hmm. talking and gesticulating, showing emotion. Emotion, right? The facial, yeah. like, facial like emotion. Yeah, the, the connection is not very good, so I'm a little bit losing the... Uh... Can you repeat? One moment. Now you you heard well? Yes. Okay. Maybe better with this one? Yes, I can hear better now. Okay. No, my question was more, more related to if you have a motion learn from data that mm -hmm. uh, describes some type of emotion mm -hmm. then this uh, when you want to create new motions uh, can be adapted according to different levels of uh, emotions i mean uh, it's different to show an emotion mm -hmm. a happy emotion or a mm -hmm. very excited emotion yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I now under, I understand your question. So, um, in in the in the video that I showed with, with this, you know, this video clip with Meryl Streep uh, with emotion and, and no emotion, uh, we were uh, uh, not uh, distinguishing between different type of emotions. We were because we had a data set that only um, distinguishes between neutral and expressive. So, without defining whether it is a, a happy or sad or uh, whatever. Uh, but th this is a, this is a, a valid problem. It's a control. Uh, it's called a style control, emotion control problem. And there are some work on this on the domain of video generation, um, and also um, like em emotion enabled uh, um, um, facial animation synthesis using 3D scan data. But at the moment, there's not really enough data to generate different categories of uh, emotion. So there are a few data sets. Uh, for example, they have one uh, sentence that are spoken in different variations of happy, sad, angry, uh, but they are vi video data sets. Um, so at the moment with my PhD student, actually, we are looking into how we can really get emotion labeled data set <laughs> so that we can feed the, this emotion control into the um, uh, generation of the uh, of the uh, of, of the motion as well. So then you can condition uh, the motion on different type of emotions, but then you have to really have for per category different type of um, uh, variations of the emotion. It, it, it's not there yet, so we don't have such a data. Um, one way to do it is, is uh, by um, um, uh, fitting in a, a 3D model uh, to the to the video. So if you work with a TV, video data set, we can extract 3D faces. Uh, but then the quality is not uh, really good. So uh, it's better to do it in the motion capture lab with a, with a facial uh, fa facial capture uh, system, um, but then that requires a lot of data uh, collection. But from an algorithmic point of view, yes, it's, it's possible. I mean, if you condition the network to learn with enough data with uh, happy, sad, angry, or you can also use not a categorical model, but you can use a two-dimensional activation um, uh, well, valence erosal uh, type of model um, to generate any type of uh, motion uh, on, on that on that space. Um, in one of the works, we were actually looking into um, learning high-level control parameters uh, to distinguish between uh, different type of emotional categories from 3D data. But there was not enough data to be used for for a generative um, uh, model, so th that part is is, is still missing uh, in, in terms of three D facial animation uh, generation. Okay, thank you. Hi, Zarin. Hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, my knowledge about uh, this area is very limited, so um, probably I will make a silly question. 
but I would like to know uh, when you talk about uh, procedural speech animation, I believe that the most difficult part is to uh, animate the mouth. Mm -hmm. All uh, right. Yeah. Why is it is not, I, I assume that the tongue is not being considered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very important uh, point actually. So traditionally, most of this work um, discard tongue animation, as you said, it's not visible; it's in the mouth, and also it's very ca uh, difficult to capture. Uh, the tongue movement, uh, so you, because it's, it's motion capture data, you cannot really have the mechanism to capture the tongue, and we are using video-based uh, systems. Um, but if you use other methods than data-driven approach, not not only um, the, the surface of the face, you can use other techniques like physics-based me methods, for example, or other type of procedural approach to to model the tongue. And I think I there was a, a last year probably in SCA, Symposium Computer Animation, there was a work uh, on tongue animation in particular uh, during speech. Uh, if I recall correctly from one of the big game companies like Ubisoft or something like that. So um, um, so it, it is something that, that the community is, is, is looking into as well. And it, it was just uh, yeah, one of the recent works actually that came out last year. Okay, uh, and just another one, a very general one. Uh, mm -hmm. You have worked on social robotics mm -hmm. and you have moved to animation. I believe that uh, almost uh, every technique that you have talked about is uh, useful in the area of social robots. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the gap? I yeah. Mean, how difficult is it to uh, extrapolate uh, um, those interesting things you have talked about mm -hmm. and bring them to a social robot yeah 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 very good question i mean i i, I have worked on both areas and i also have this question always in, in my mind and i also talk with other colleagues as well um so um i think a lot of the things that is working for virtual agents they can be applied to the to the robots as well um but of course robot has some hardware constraints um, so the things that are working for, for virtual humans in certain cases in simulations might not be directly working uh, as expected on the, on, the, on the robots, right? So uh, they can go uh, much, much uh, uh, slower, uh, the, the, the motors. I developed a facial expression like lip sync animation for a robotic agent uh, many years back. It was a museum guide uh, robot. So we were first applying the things on the virtual agent and then directly applying the same thing. Uh, even mapping from the motion capture data directly to the to the robot, it was a very realistic face uh, of a robot. Things didn't went very very smooth because the the, the robot's uh, motors were, were very small, the, 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 so slow, uh, and the lip syncing was not um, uh, working as expected, and it was not really able to handle the the data stream that is coming. So it was skipping frames, and it was not able to create the the realistic effect as uh, as expected. Um, so uh, these kind of things has to be adapted for, for, for robots because they will not be able to uh, satisfy the physical uh, uh, limitations and the algorithms has to be adapted. But on a basic level, I think it, it, it's the same. Uh, and there, there is a lot to be learned from these two communities uh, both ways, I, I think. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, hello again. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a, uh, a question about the motion capturing. When you talk about the gazing problem, mm -hmm. uh, you, I think you tell that the women wearing the suit is mm -hmm. a professional actress? Yes. Yeah, OK. So I would like to know if you have ever received any feedback from professional actors or actresses uh, if they feel more comfortable wearing a suit or with a non marks uh, I mean, uh, wearing a marker-based uh, uh, suite or with a markerless system only camera base or 
if they feel the same or not. Because we have uh, a very little experience with with cameras uh, recording ourselves, and we think that it is a bit intrusive wearing a suite, and we feel much more comfortable without any suite. So I would yeah. like to know if you have any feedback. Yeah, you. definitely. Yes, uh, we have the same observation. It's not very easy to wear this kind of uh, astronaut <laughs> costume with, with everything on the head, and it's really heavy, and then they cannot really keep it for for a very long time. This is a, a gen general problem in computer animation and game uh, community also for, for movies. And for that, there are actually specialized mocap artists. They are used to these kind of con conditions, but it's of course not so easy to find these kind of people. Um, yeah, two weeks ago, we were doing some experiments with some actors in, in the mocap lab, like professional actors. It took like a whole day <laughs> and it was really, really difficult at the end and very tiring for these people. Uh, even though they are professional actors, so they have to really rest a little bit and they cannot change these clothes easily. So you have to really plan your data collection session very efficiently. Um, it, it's better to, to give breaks, maybe do half half day sessions, not squeeze everything. So do, do your best to, to comfort these people so that you can get the best quality. Uh, and managing this session, data collection session is also a very important challenge, actually. Okay, thank you very much. It seems that uh, they have no more questions. So thank you again for your virtual visit and we hope to keep in touch with you. Thank you very much for inviting and uh, greetings from Netherlands to everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.